fun and you get to learn a lot about Jesus and God and why you should follow them. I like how it pushes you to be like more motivated to read the Bible. People that do go to Bible really, I've seen like personality changes and heart changes with them. I've learned that God always is going to be there for us even after hard times. We are dedicated to building a strong, durable, reliable foundation that's not just going to last them for one or two years, but it's going to last them their lifetime. Out they have these life, kids find out they have life, they have, they have purpose, they have value, they have all of these things. Once they get these verses once they get these verses in their heart, once they understand that God, God is love and God, God loves them, love and God then they actually them, go out and show love to others. Let me understand what let me understand what faith is. I want to know God Himself. I just kind of want to. It's what I just kind of want to Not only am I a volunteer, not only am I a volunteer program, but I also have a son. But I also have a son who attends class and so I get different class, and so I get to see the benefits and the blessings of both sides. A lot of them have never heard the basic, the basic you know, Bible so stories. Just to see so them just learning. to see them learning and growing is just really, growing is just really after exciting. Teaching lesson, after teaching a lesson what a relationship about with Jesus what a relationship and with Jesus really, really means and having a girl come up to me afterwards she and say that she prayed that decided to start a relationship with Jesus that day for the first time. That day for the first time. I mean, that's why we teach. That's why we teach. That's what we want kids to realize. They can have a relationship That they can have a relationship with Jesus. Some topics that may not get touched on in like other youth groups I've learned more. As a youth pastor, as a youth pastor, actually, um, one of the biggest actually, frustrations is one of the biggest frustrations getting kids to actually sometimes getting kids to come actually and participate. Come and you know, participate. Their schedules are busier than you know, their ever. Schedules so are busier their than sports ever. commitments. There's family commitments. There's family sports commitments. There's just family lots commitments. of excuses. There's just lots of excuses on why they can't make it on a Sunday night to youth, group, Sunday night to youth group, release time program. Has been their release time program has been awesome because, because literally nothing there's that literally nothing that interferes with their ability to have to come. And so we have never had an opportunity we've never had before to reach students during the school day and and pour into them. School, we'll transport the kids from the school to our location. Our students, students are not allowed to miss any core not classes. To miss any we're privately classes. funded, so there's no uh, funded, so there's tax dollars. Uh, the school is not paying anything. The school is not paying anything. This is a totally free thing to the school system. The parents have to sign off. 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 The students to attend our program. It's a volunteer program. Something where they're forced to come or anything. They get forced to come or anything. Reaching students, reaching essentials for us, essential for us to build the kingdom yeah. being able to yeah. influence being them being able to influence them and reach uh, them and for the kingdom and reach them for the kingdom we had a new student day we had a new student for the first time uh, for the first walk time through our doors uh, and walked through our doors God. and said I'm I don't believe really in God sure. and I'm not really sure why but I wanted to come check this out I wanted to come check this out after she spent uh, after she uh, about spent with us uh, about a month with us here in release time she began to hear God words and what God was what Jesus had done for her and she gave her heart to the Lord Hello? Yep, we're here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Emily, and this is Jenna, and together we are co-directing the Wapakoneta Release Time program that has started just a couple weeks ago. Release Time is an awesome opportunity to share the love of God and the saving power of Jesus Christ. However, three things do need to be in place to make it possible and legal. So the first thing is, no taxpayer dollars are being used to fund this program. So it's privately funded by churches, individuals, or maybe even local businesses. Second, it is nowhere on school grounds. So all of these classes are being held at a nearby church or a meeting area where those students can be walked or bused to those locations. Lastly, uh, what makes the release time program legal is parental consent. So all of the students attending these classes, their parents have given us written approval for their child to attend. So unfortunately, no students can just walk in and be a part of these classes without their parental consent. 
So we are Kingdom Harvest Ministries, also known as KHM. KHM is a nonprofit organization based out of Salina, and they've been around since about 2018. They've helped other communities in our area get their release time programs up and running, and they've been so helpful, helpful for us in Wapak. They've helped Salina, Parkway and St. Mary's get up and running and they've been very successful for the Lord for the last several years. We are also teamed up with eight other churches in our community who support us financially, prayerfully, and agree with our statement of faith and you are also one of those churches. Well, thank you guys so much for having us this morning. Isn't God so good? He's just so good and we are so grateful for you guys having us. Um, so we're up here and visiting today because we need you guys. We, we are in need of more volunteers and we want more students too. We have been, oh man, we got our program started uh, just two weeks ago. We've had two classes so far and we have over 60 students registered. And right now we are just in the middle school in Wapak and it's been going really good, but we are definitely in need and we are looking for people who are christ-centered and who have a heart for children um, or if maybe you're just looking for an area to serve maybe this is it so we are in need right now of a sixth grade teacher and we are also in need of some adult walkers uh, we We've got a few, but we definitely need more. We have uh, people who meet the kids at the school and then they get to walk the kids down the sidewalk that's behind the football stadium in Wapak and they make it over to Wapak First Church. The kids get to their classroom, they get a great Bible lesson, and then when that's over, the adults will walk them back to school and drop them off. So it's gone really well so far, but we definitely could, could use some more help. Um, there also are other ways to help. We could use more prayer warriors, and um, we are just grateful for those of you that are on our prayer team already. It's such a cool ministry, and we're super grateful for the prayers that you guys have have taken to the Lord on our behalf. Um, and we also are asking for financial help too. It's like she said, it's completely privately funded. We have to keep everything separate, you know, church and state, whatnot. So um, we're all completely privately funded. And yeah, if you guys have more questions, we are gonna be hanging out downstairs and we would love to chat with you. Um, we are just super grateful to be here today. So thank you guys. Thank you. I was able to help Friday morning, this past Friday morning, to uh, walk some students to the class. And I'm telling you, it was so much fun. It was really easy. You just got to keep track of about 20 <laughs> junior high kids. Takes a team of four adults to do it, but uh, we haven't had any, any real problems. One kid stepped in cement, so that was fun, wet cement. But it's not our cement, so who cares? No. <laughs> Uh, but it, this is a fantastic opportunity here to impact a new generation for God's kingdom. And let me tell you, kids can do some amazing, amazing things. I want to show you a few things in the Bible that astonished me when I learned them, so I'm kind of hoping they astonish you too uh, when, when I tell you about them. So if you have a Bible, we're doing it a little differently. There's no bulletin notes or anything like that, so we're just kind of... Flying by the, we're going a little impromptu here. So if you have a Bible, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. And we're going to look at verses 12 through 15 here. This is perhaps one of the most famous stories in all the Bible. 1 Samuel 17, 12 through 15. This is, this is the story of David and Goliath, for those of you that are un, unfamiliar with it. Well, I'm just going to read a little section here uh, from this story. So I'm going to go ahead and read it here. It says, Now David was the son of an Ephrathite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time he was very old. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war. The firstborn was Eliab, the second Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep 
at Bethlehem. So this is, this is kind of our bigger introduction to David. We're, the ironic thing is that in 1 Samuel 16, David gets anointed as king, but we don't really learn anything about him except that he has a heart that God loves. And so here we have this introduction to him as a shepherd in Israel. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think shepherd, I think that's an adult job, right? That, that would be something, if you're going to herd a bunch of sheep, you're going to want a, an adult with a strong voice to command the sheep to go where they need to go. And then I went to Israel. And in Israel to this day, and it was the same thing, a thousand, well, this was about 3,000 years ago, shepherds are typically 8 to 10-year-old boys. So when we were in Israel, we came across this family. Uh, they were Bedouin, uh, which means they literally live off the land. They do everything as they did in the Old Testament. Um, and they had a bunch of sheep, and there were a couple kids in charge of these sheep. And so here we're introduced to David. A mighty warrior, a great king. He's only eight years old when he kills Goliath. But he had the faith to know that God was with him. And so this is one kid. And I was thinking of other, other shepherds in the Old Testament. There's not, there's not many. We have Abraham, but we're told he's older, um, and Isaac and Jacob. But there's, there's a prophet who is also a shepherd, Amos from Tekoa. Uh, he was a shepherd. And so Amos, another, he's a prophet, right? He's going to be an older kid or an older guy, but he's probably just a kid when God calls him to a great task of prophesying to Israel. And so we have this eight-year-old kid in David that God used him to do an amazing thing. And I, I, I didn't put this in my notes, but I was thinking, like, what other kids are there in the Old Testament that we think of? Well, I thought of Josiah, right? This great king of Israel. He was eight years old when he took the throne. How, how many, any eighth graders in here? Any eighth graders, any second or third graders? No. Any eighth, eight, or eight-year-olds, rather. Um, like, these are kids that God is using to proclaim his word and build his kingdom and spread his greatness. Next, I want to look at a group of people. Turn to Matthew chapter 17, verses 24 through 28. And here we have an interesting story where it's written, After Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma temple tax came to Peter and asked, Doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he does, he replied. When Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. What do you think, Simon? He asked. From whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their own children or from others? From others, Peter answered. Then the children are exempt, Jesus said to him. But so that we may not cause offense, go to the lake and throw out your line. Take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. Now we can dive into the, the financial aspects of taxes and all that stuff that Jesus teaches here. And you know, he causes the miracle with the coin and the fish. But what I want to point out is that this is for the temple tax. The temple tax was only due, like you only had to pay it if you were over 18 years old. Jesus and Peter are the only two that have to pay this temple tax, which means all the other disciples are teenagers. And some even suggest that John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was as young as eight years old. So Jesus calls this group of kids to him to follow him as disciples for three years and then unleashes them on the world. And you can read in the book of Acts of how they absolutely changed the world. And that's why we have a church here today. All because Jesus poured into these kids for three years and taught them how to live in the kingdom of God. I always wondered as a kid growing up, you'd see pictures like, like the, um, the, perhaps the most famous one, The Last Supper. The, uh, it was Michelangelo painted or Da Vinci or one, some old Italian guy painted The Last Supper, and it's Jesus with all these grown men at the table. But then, like, I'm a historical, like, I like history. Okay, I don't know if you've got any other history people in here. You know, you have the letters written, right? You have, you have Peter writes a couple letters. You have uh, Paul, of course, writes, you know, he wasn't a disciple, a different story. You have John writes letters, and he writes the book of Revelation. I'm like, 
if these guys are like adults or old, like how long did they live that they're writing letters well into the first century, towards the end of the first century? Because they lived for decades after they followed Jesus. Well, it's because they were just kids. Think about it. Jesus was crucified. We quibble on dates around 30 AD. Most scholars agree that the book of Revelation was written in 95 AD, 65 years. How old was John? He couldn't have been much older than a kid when he was following Jesus. The math just doesn't add up right. And so Jesus took this group of kids that, and we can go into more of this, but they had basically flunked out of religious school, what we would call Bible school, synagogue. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in, our, in our last story here that I want to look at. But they were outcasts. They, had, they were doing their family's work, which means they weren't smart enough to keep going in synagogue school to learn the rest of the Old Testament. And Jesus says, hey, you, you come follow me, and I'll teach you. And I'll make you into a force that's going to change the world forever. And it also clarifies, I always wondered about this. If you skip ahead to Matthew 18, uh, verses 1 through 6, then I'm going to skip down to verse 10. Um, It says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever, comes, and whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. That's joyful, right? Skip down to verse 10. It says, See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. We see time and time again, Jesus exalts children. And in verse 6, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, his disciples. I always wondered, like, why does he call them little ones? Those who believe in me. It's because they're kids. Just another reinforcement of the fact that Jesus' disciples were just young teenagers, and Jesus used them to change the world. And I got one more story here, and this blew my mind. Turn to Acts 16. I've read Acts several times over the course of my following Jesus, and I've read this passage, and it always confused me, and then it was answered for me in research a couple weeks ago, and it's, it's a beautiful thing. Acts 16, verses 1 and 2. It says, Paul came to Derbe and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. I'd always wondered, like we always talk about Timothy with his mom and his grandmother. Paul specifically points them out in one of his letters to Timothy. But we don't know anything about his dad. And here we're told whose father was a Greek. Why does that matter? I hope in the times that I have preached, I've explained to you that words matter in the Bible. They don't just put them there willy-nilly like, oh, this is just a fun little detail. Like, no, like there's a purpose to this. And so I was listening to a podcast. Well, it was more of a lecture uh, on Spotify, deemed as a podcast. But it was a lecture uh, by this guy named Ray Vanderlaan, who's a brilliant, brilliant teacher. And he pointed out... If you turn all the way back to Deuteronomy, chapter 23, Deuteronomy 23, verse 3, tells us, No Ammonite or Moabite or any of their descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord, not even in the tenth generation. Now, what does that have to do with the story in Acts? Well, According to the Mishnah, uh, the Mishnah was a collection of Jewish oral traditions based on scripture. So we have the law, okay, Genesis to uh, Deuteronomy, the Torah. That was the law in Israel. Most of the laws are in Leviticus, but there's laws elsewhere as well in Exodus, Numbers, etc. Well, you have the law, but the application of the law wasn't always clear. For example, what does it mean to keep the Sabbath? 
That was a point of tension between Jesus and the Pharisees because in their oral tradition, how they described work on the Sabbath was different than how Jesus would have described it. And so there was always that tension of, well, is it good to do work on the Sabbath? Is it good to heal on the Sabbath? Is that okay? Like, what's the what, what's right or wrong? So they had what was called the Mishnah, which was basically the application of the law in the Old Testament, how to deal with certain situations in everyday life that they would come across. And so according to the Mishnah, Deuteronomy 23.3, it was basically any offspring of a biblically or of a scripturally forbidden union or marriage. That was how they apply it, that if you were a kid from a marriage that was not religiously lawfully okay, you could not enter into the assembly. Now, the assembly was synagogue. It was their church. Every synagogue also had a school where the disciples would have flunked out of. But you go to the school to learn. Now their educational system was learning the Old Testament, learning the scriptures. But if, you, if you're a child from an unbiblical marriage, you can't go. You can't learn the scriptures. You're what was called a momzer, M-A-M-Z-E-R. That's what Timothy was. He was a momzer. He grew up probably wanting to go to synagogue. I'm sure his mom and his grandmother wanted him to go to the synagogue school, but they couldn't. He couldn't because he was because his father was a Greek. It wasn't a Jewish marriage. And so, but if you fast forward, um, turn to 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. This is Paul's last letter that he wrote that we have before he passed away, before he was killed. In 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15, it tells us, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know from those you, whom you learned it. Or, yeah. Uh, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. He knew the scriptures from infancy. And so I'm assuming this is why Paul commends his mom and grandmother and the faith that they had that they passed on to him. Because even though he couldn't go to synagogue, they still taught him the scriptures. He still wanted to know and to learn. And so this kid who is an outcast in Jewish culture, because if you couldn't go to synagogue, you were like, that was a huge deal. That was the center of their community. And so Timothy wasn't able to go. So he wasn't really a part of the community. He was an outcast. And then Paul shows up. He goes to, um, to, to Lystra or Iconium. I forget which one it was that, that Timothy lived. And he sees this outcast and how he knows the scriptures and how he loves the Bible. And he's like, I want you to follow me because there's a heart in you that just loves God's word. And as history would have it, if you turn back to 1 Timothy 1, I'm going to read verses 3 through 7. Paul writes them. Um, he says, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus, so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they are talking about or what they, or what they so confidently affirm. That outcast that couldn't go to synagogue, that outcast that still had a yearning for God's word turned into a leader in the Ephesian church to the point that Paul was writing him letters like, hey, you take charge. You know what's true. You know what the Bible says. So when these other false teachers come along and try to tell something differently, like make sure they don't do that. Keep them from doing that because it's deceitful and it's wrong. And you know what you're talking about. 
And so when we're talking about this opportunity at KHM and in Wapak and Crydersville schools, it's so much more, I think, than just going and helping. The impact that this can have is monumental. And I know that, that you know, some of you guys, like working with kids, it takes a special person to work with kids because they can be crazy. I'm a youth pastor, I understand this. <laughs> but it doesn't take a lot of work. When, when I was there Friday morning, it was easy. I had fun. I learned this one girl has crush on two different boys. And let me tell you, that was a fun conversation with her and her friends. That was a good time. But these kids, they're awesome. And they just, they want adults in their lives to point them to Jesus. They need adults in their lives to point them to Jesus. And this is the opportunity we have at our hands. I can't believe it. It astonished me when, when I found this out that you can actually go into schools and teach them the Bible. And it was even more astonishing to me when I found out that this is happening at pretty much every other local school. Um, the only one that I don't know if, it ha if it's there or not is Lima City. I don't, I don't know if they've got a problem. Sorry, Spencer. Uh, I don't know if they've got a problem or a program up and running yet, but Bath, Perry. Perry just started this fall. Uh, Bath has been going for a couple of years. Elida, Delphus, Shawnee, and now Wapak. Um, this is a fantastic opportunity. And even if you're like, kids give me headaches, like there's other ways to serve, okay? Give money. Find other, like there's so many opportunities here that we could potentially pour into the next Timothy. We could pour into the next Peter. We could pour into the next David. We could pour into the next Amos. That these kids, five years, 10 years, 15 years from now, are spreading the gospel to the people in their lives because of what a select few people did when they were in school to teach them the Bible and to show them how much God loves them and to show them how amazing God is. And I don't want us to pass up this opportunity because I, I, I don't think that there's an easier way to teach the kids the Bible than what we've got going on at our local schools. It's a beautiful thing. And so I hope that you will take up this opportunity, talk with Emily, talk with Jenna, because this is the next generation. This is the church that we get to impact now that's going to have reverberations into eternity. It's going to have eternal impact. And I don't want us to miss out on this. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you love kids. Your, your word makes it very clear in how you have used kids from early on, from David to Amos to the disciples to Timothy, Father, to grow your kingdom, to show the world how great you are. And Father, we pray that we would make the most of this opportunity to teach these kids in these schools the gospel, to teach them how great you are, and to show them the truth of your word. So, Father, I thank you for this opportunity, and I pray that we would be a blessing to you, be a blessing to these kids, be a blessing to these families, and ultimately to this community as more people see just how great you are and how much you love them. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. <laughs>